Well, this is part six and the final episode, Lord willing, of this series, Broken to Bold, Contrite to Confident. And I trust that you have been engaged in this series and that you have been edified and uplifted. I think that this uh, last part, part six, will hopefully uh, seal the deal for you and just give you great encouragement uh, in knowing your status before the Lord. We are constantly reminding ourselves that this is a story about the northern kingdom of Israel, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's the primary significance in that Jesus came to save this prodigal son, this lost sheep of the house of Israel that had sinned and those who were in Judah were very judgmental. They represent the elder brother. But the secondary application leads us to see why there is great joy when one comes to know Jesus as their Savior, when they come to know him as the Lord, as the risen Lord, King of kings, and that he is our husband. He is our life. We were lost just like the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God went to find them in the day that he was among his sheep, and he found that sheep and rejoiced. He did the same for you when he gave you faith in him, when he made you willing in the day of his power. Psalm 110 verse 3, rejoice with me, the Savior says. He wants all of us to rejoice as we come to know his children and who they are who have placed their trust solely in his precious blood. Rejoice with me, uh, the woman says. I found the coin. All right. So this is uh, all of this was prophesied in the Old Testament of what God would do in bringing his people to himself. And Israel, of course, was the example of humanity at large for ages and ages to come, age without end, as Ephesians chapter 3, verse 21 tells us. Joy prophesied in prodigal premonitions. We saw last week, if we've never been broken, we don't need fixing. All right? Jesus was being sarcastic. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Those who admit, I have nothing. Those who come to me saying, I have, those who come to Jesus saying, have mercy on us. Have mercy. The two blind men, have mercy, son of David. The publican, when they were both praying at the temple, smote his, upon his breast, would not so much as lift his eyes to the heaven because he knew, as we will see, as we have seen, uh, that when they see God, he cannot look upon them without his mercy and his favor. No one is left broken. No one is left broken who places their faith solely in Jesus. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news, gospel, the evangel. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted. This has nothing to do with losing your boyfriend, girlfriend, Losing a loved one, as tragic as that is. Losing a job. No, that's not the type of brokenhearted we're talking about here. All the world goes through that kind of brokenheartedness. We all lose relationships, breakups, struggling, physical death, physical sickness. We all have those things. But the spiritual sickness, the spiritual brokenheartedness is what Jesus came to heal. To bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, release to the prisoners, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. In other words, they had come mourning. All of those believers in the Old Testament were mourning for their sin. They were sorrowful for what they had done. They knew they were separated from the holiest of all. And now in this beautiful covenant, we don't have to wait for the Redeemer to come. The moment we come to that realization by the grace of God, when it is revealed to us, our need for a Savior, at that very moment, he sets us up into his glorious kingdom. The planning of the Lord. We are oaks of righteousness, trees planted by rivers of water, Psalm 1. To, why? To display his glory. Well, let's look at this now. We saw this horrible plight of mourning and brokenness, but we did not give the answer. Well, we did in, in a roundabout way, but now what we see are passages 
that say that once you have mourned, you will be brought into God's favor. And that was true in the Old Testament, but they had to wait for it. For us today, we do not have to wait for it. It's instantaneous. When we come to that realization, Lord have mercy. And he says, man, he is rich in mercy to all who call upon him. Ezekiel 16, 60 through 63, yet I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. I will establish with you an everlasting covenant. See Isaiah 55. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed when I take your sisters, both your elder and your younger, and give them to you as daughters, but not on account of my covenant with you. I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, in order that you may remember and be confounded and never open your mouth again because of your shame. And that's very similar to what we see in Romans 3, that all the world may become, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. That's what happens when law is revealed. It just simply shows all of us as sinners. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We cannot obey the law. It's impossible. The carnal mind is at enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. When I forgive you all that you have done, says the Lord. I'm going to work my way through this fairly quickly so we can uh, wrap this thing up. Proverbs 29 verse 23, a person's pride will bring humiliation. That's the pride of self-righteousness, the Pharisees. They were humiliated in the day of vengeance. But one who is lowly in spirit admits they have nothing before God. They will obtain honor. Psalm 30 verse 11, you have turned my mourning. This is prophetic of the new covenant. You have turned my mourning into dancing. You have taken off my sackcloth and clothed me with joy. As we will see, what happened with Job? He repented what? In sackcloth and ashes. Okay, this is beautiful imagery where God comes to remove it and he replaces it with himself. Himself, his righteousness. You were clothed with Christ. That is joy. The Bible says, I will go unto the altar of God, unto God, my exceeding joy. Psalm 42, 43, and of course, 63. Psalm 51, the sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit. He will only accept that. He will accept no pride. No flesh will glory in his presence. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Wow, what a wonderful thing to be accepted in the sight of God. And he only accepts that broken heart. And once he does, you're in like Flynn. You are in for good. You are his. You have a robe of righteousness. Psalm 126, 5 and 6. May those who sow in tears, that's the tears of sin, the sorrows of sin. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, right? Those who sow in tears reap with shouts of joy. That's what we have now thanks to the cross and risen life of Jesus and his parousia or presence in us. Those who go out weeping, bearing the seed for sowing, shall come home with shouts of joy carrying their sheaves, just see groups, groups of uh, these stalks of wheat. It's a beautiful picture there. And now listen to this. I'll make my way through this quickly. Job 42 verses 1 through 17. Again, prophetic, very prophetic, a strong type of repentance and the reward that is given to God's children upon that repentance, when they turn from self-righteousness, self-worship, and say, Lord, I have nothing. I need you, your presence, your forgiveness, your mercy. Job answered the Lord, I know you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel with knowledge, put in quotes, when he's basically quoting God. Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. In other words, he, 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 he began to confess himself. He began to confess his righteousness and God had to reprove him. He couldn't understand why are all these bad things happening. And Eliphaz, Zophar, and Bildad were being like those Pharisaic Jews and accusing him. And, and Job's like, what did I do? And even then with all his righteousness, he finally be, began to testify of himself. He'd gotten to his wits end. Why me? Why do I have boils? Why have I lost all my children? Why have I lost all of my, my livestock and, and my servants? And so he began to confess himself. And God, because he's so holy, 
He had to reprove him. He had to show him, who are you, Job? He says, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak, he quotes God again. I will question you and you declare to me, end quote. And then Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself. I despise myself. All the great men and women of God came to this conclusion. And oh, how they were rewarded greatly at that great resurrection, that bringing in of life, bringing them, planting them in Christ, in the land, in that new city, the church, the new Jerusalem. Therefore, I despise myself and repent and sat in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job. What happens upon that confession? This is a type of the kingdom of God. He restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. (laughs) And what does that remind you of? Isaiah chapter 40. It says, cry, speak to her, speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Cry unto her that her warfare is over and that her iniquity is pardoned. For the Lord has rewarded her, what? Double for her sins. Wow. The Lord gave Job twice as much as he had had before. Our iniquities pardoned. We have eternal life. We have the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings dwelling in our hearts. I should say double. (laughs) Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. Well, what's that? That's the prodigal son. Remember, that's the woman who found the coin and they all rejoiced with her. That's the one who went out, the shepherd who went out from the 99 and found the one. And he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Here's all the brothers. They ate bread with him in his house. This is the church. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Ah, oh, that reminds me of Psalm 42 and 43. Lord, your water spouts, at the noise of your water spouts, all your waves and billows have gone over me. What is that? That is the curse of the law. The law is overwhelming. The torrent, the storm, the blackness and darkness of tempest, of sin. It had overcome, it had subdued. Remember the one passage. They've gone over my head. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. That reminds me of the Samaritan. Remember the dogs licked his sores. Uh, uh, The the person who had fallen among thieves, the the Samaritan came to him and comforted him. And the dogs were licking the sores of that that man who had fell among those thieves and robbers, those self-righteous accusatory Pharisees. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. And each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. Wow. Wow, this is so prophetic. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he named the first Joe Mama. Oh, excuse me, Jemima. (laughs) I was just playing there. I thought that was kind of funny. The second, Keziah. And the third, Karen Hupuk. And all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. Do you see this as prophetic? I sure do. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations, and Job died old and full of days. Matthew 5, 4, Jesus says this. This is a kingdom passage. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And I should say he comforted them. Amen. He gave them himself, his presence, eternal life and immortality. Luke 15, when he came to himself, how many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare? But here I am dying of hunger. Jesus says, whoever hungers, let him come to me. Whoever thirsts, let him come to me. I will get up, go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. The publican, be merciful to me, a sinner. The blind man, have mercy on us, son of David. 
Simon, she is a sinner. She's there at the feet of Jesus, weeping with joy, tears, all that ointment, giving him everything, all she had. Father, I sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. What did the psalmist say? Is I'd rather dwell on a, uh, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God, right? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God. It's a spirit. It's a posture of humility. I'm not worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still afar off, his father saw him when he was filled with compassion. That's the heart of Jesus toward you. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. What an affectionate father we have. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, how beautiful. Quickly bring out a robe, the best one, my son, the robe of righteousness, the clothing of Jesus. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf. Kill it. Let us eat and celebrate. There it is. Rejoice with me. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. I hope we feel that way about all of God's children as we see them. They have his robe of righteousness. They have Jesus. We see them as Jesus sees them. We don't accuse them. We don't bring up their past. Hebrews chapter 4, indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. This is the gospel. This is speaking about Jesus. Piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It discerns, judges the thoughts and intentions of the heart. That's why he wants us open. He sees it anyway, and he's just saying, be open with me. Oh, would to God that we would be able to do that to one another. Amen. Be able to see each other. Be able to see the darkest, deepest, grossest secrets of each other and say you're perfect, you're blameless in the eyes of God. You have the robe of righteousness, the righteousness of Jesus. You're as righteous as Jesus. And before him, no creature's hidden. We might as well. But all are naked and bare to the eyes of the one whom we must render an account. This is just simply taking us back to that imagery of nakedness in the garden. Adam, Eve, I see your sin. Don't try and cover yourselves with your fig leaf, your works. I just move those aside. I see it. Let me clothe you. Let me give you my skin, my clothing, my son. They're all open to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Hallelujah. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but glory to God. We have one who in every respect has been tested as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness. Broken to bold, there it is, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And has he ever given us that grace and mercy? We come boldly, Hebrews chapter 10. We have boldness, we have assurance because we've entered in to the holiest of all by the blood of Jesus. It's all gone. All of our sins are gone. Removed as far as the east is from the west. And finally, God says to the wicked, Listen to what he says. Very important. This is so prophetic. Isaiah 57, 12 through 19. I will declare your righteousness and your works for they shall not do you any good. Our good deeds, dung, filthy rags, menstrual rags. Philippians 2 and 3. Isaiah 64. When you cry, let your gathering deliver you, but the wind shall carry them all away. Isn't that interesting? Our iniquities, like the wind, have carried them all away, carried us all away. Again, Isaiah 64, 4 through 6. Vanity shall take them, but watch. He who puts his trust in me shall possess the land. That land is Jesus. He is our inheritance. God said, remember, I am your portion and, and the lot of your inheritance. I am your portion. 
God is the land. They shall inherit my holy mountain, the church, Mount Zion, Hebrews 12, 22. And he shall say, raise up, raise up, clear the way, make the stumbling block rise out of the way of my people. For so says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity. He has made his church his eternal dwelling place, whose name is holy, the Holy One of Israel. Watch. Are you ready? This is the dwelling place of God, Ephesians 2 and John 14. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. He says, my Father and I will come and we will make our dwelling place with him, the church. Watch. I dwell in the high and holy place. That's the church. Even with the contrite and humble spirit. Look at that. To revive the spirit of the humble. Broken to bold. Contrite to confident. To revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever. Nor will I be always angry. God was angry. He was filled with wrath. But what did he do? He poured out all that anger and wrath on his son. It was taken from us poured on the Son so that He would enjoy us and we would enjoy Him. For the Spirit should fail before me in the souls I have made. For the iniquity of His covetousness, I was angry and struck Him. Ugh, that's what the law did. It struck us. It smote us. So that sin might become exceedingly sinful. He says, I hid myself and was angry. It is not that the Lord's hand is shortened or is ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your sins have separated you from your God and he has hidden his face from you, Isaiah 59. I hid myself. I was angry. But Jesus, the showbread, the bread of life, the showbread, that Hebrew word means a turning of the face. Jesus is the bread of life. And when we eat of the bread of life, God turns his face, a turning of the face. Jesus is that showbread that causes God's face to look upon us and smile in his countenance to behold us. This is the holiest of all. I hid myself. I was angry. He went on turning away in the way of his heart. I've seen his ways and I will heal him. Hosea 13, I will love, or 11, I believe. I will love them. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, he says. I will also lead him. The Bible says he leads us by streams of living water. I will restore comfort to him and to his mourners. Mourning first. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near. That's what we see in Ephesians 2. To the one who is near the Jews, he broke down, made of the two Gentile and Jew, one new person in Christ Jesus, creating peace. Why? What does it say? He is our peace. Jesus. Peace, peace to him that is afar off and to him that is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. With his stripes we are healed. Amen. <sighs> well, I don't know about you, but I am thoroughly excited and thank you for taking the time to watch this a little bit lengthier video than usual. Please subscribe at NCMI Live and please support us again. Support us at patreon.com forward slash NCMI live. Patreon.com NCMI live. And I truly hope and pray that you were blessed by this study. Broken to bold. Be confident. You are no longer contrite or broken. You are now restored. You are comforted. You are in his presence. You are bold. You're shouting for joy. It's exciting. So man, when you blow it, know that you are still pure and holy in his eyes even though it doesn't feel like it just remember that come boldly before that throne of grace get excited you're in the presence of jesus amen you're in the presence of jesus the almighty god creator of heaven and earth the lover of your soul who has redeemed you and given you everlasting life immortality now you have it now God's peace be with you. Amen. Glory, hallelujah.